Is Christianity sexist? If you follow the Bible, which we're going to look at tonight, you will come to the conclusion, I think, that actually Christianity isn't sexist, and that both male and female have an important part to play in the eyes of God. However, if you don't believe in the Bible, then you may think Christianity is sexist. But if we're going to look at the subject, we need to understand what the Bible says about, about sexism, if you like, and how the roles of men and women feature in the purpose of God. So, by way of an overview, I'd like us to look at what the definition of sexism is. Look at some of the Old Testament views of the sexes in the scriptures. Because Christianity is based upon the Old Testament teaching, isn't it? And therefore, what we need to look at first is look at the foundation of, of Christianity. We look at the divine institution of marriage, because it's fundamental that we understand that in the purpose of God. Then we're going to look at a few accounts of how women featured in the ministry of Christ. And then also how women featured in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul brought the gospel message to the nations other than the Jews, of which we are a part of that class. So it's important perhaps to understand how he taught as well and what he thought. Then we'll look at the role of women in the ecclesia or churches in our other, um, AV version and other versions. I use the word ecclesia as, as Tim did. I think it better summarises a group of called out people rather than perhaps a connotation with a building or an organisation, an institution. So I'll use tonight uh, the word uh, ecclesia. And then we'll bring our thoughts to a matter and we can perhaps answer the question for ourselves, is Christianity sexist? And then I'll leave you with one final thought on that. Now I've got all the quotes on the screen tonight. If you don't want to, want to spend time listening rather than making notes, that's fine. So there are on the screen. I'll use different translations and you'll see from the screen which translation I'm using. So then, when we talk about sexism, we talk about a prejudice against a group or a class of people. And particularly tonight, we're thinking about sexism when we're talking about men and women. Is the Bible sexist against women? Now we know there's much uh, debate in the world at large on, on what sex is. That's not the purpose of our talk this evening. It really is about the role of man and woman uh, in in God's purpose. We can start no better place than right at the beginning of the Bible, can we? And we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we didn't have to wait too long in the scriptures to get the first, you know, 27 verses into, into the whole book. And we see that part of God's purpose to do with men and women straight away. If you've ever read the account of Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2 gives us a greater detail about how he created man and how he created woman. Now, man was created from the dust of the ground, but what's interesting to say here, that God, when he created everything and he created mankind, women were not around at the earth at that time. And God said it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him, says the, the New King James Version. But what he did next was interesting, because rather than do that, get rid of that mouse, before Adam, all the beasts of the field, everything God had created, he came before Adam. And he went wait and see to see what Adam would call them. What would he call the animals? Now there was a reason for that, which we'll find out in the next few verses. So Adam saw all these animals, all these creatures, and he named them one after another. But the test was, if you like, for, for God and the angel was, would Adam see anything that he could relate to out of all the animal creation? Anything like himself. But Adam had said he found nothing, he found no helper which was comparable to him. Not surprising, because Adam was unique in the whole creation of God. So why would God not create man and woman to start with? Well, there were some lessons to be learned that man needs a helper. And it was going to come from God. But not like Adam who was created out of the dust of the earth. It was going to come from Adam. Because we read on in verse 21 and 22 of the, of the chapter there in Genesis chapter 2. That the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. The first surgery in the scriptures isn't it? And the first anesthesia as well perhaps in the whole history of mankind. But God, however he did it, put man to sleep, Adam to sleep. 
And he took a rib from Adam and he made it into a woman. And he brought her to the man. Now you might think that's a bit far-fetched. Well, the Bible is not a book about medical and physiological textbook, is it? It's trying to portray to us some principles. So we don't need to worry about how God did it. If he did explain to us, the Bible would probably be this thick with all the formulas and chemical analysis and, and what God did. So we don't need to get a head up about how God did it. He just did it. But what's interesting, though, he took one of the ribs from Adam, a companion. So we could see why I took it. The rib came from the side of Adam. And that's telling us, really, that this woman was to be his companion together to fulfill God's will. And so Adam, when he saw that, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we see the real close relationship between man and woman. Yes, man was created out of just the ground, but Eve, the woman, was even more special than that. It didn't come from the earth, from the ground, it came from Adam. So we can see that real bond there that was right there from the start. But God was going to set forth his creation, man and woman, together. As another part of the scripture says, they were to be heirs together for the grace of life. So we can see kind of the intimate nature and relationship between man and woman that God had created. What's interesting here, though, is that in verse 24, and we picked up this verse in Ephesians, which we'll look at shortly, the commentary there was given at this time, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, Adam and Eve didn't have a mother or a father. God created Adam, and God created Eve from Adam. So this is something that's going to come later. It was a principle that was set forward. It's a divine institution of marriage. Now, there are many marriages, but this is what, what God is saying is a divine institution of, of marriage. And we read, didn't we, in Ephesians. And the Apostle says, this is a great mystery. And as we read through in Ephesians chapter 5, there are quite a number of verses there which give us the roles of the man and the woman. So we read in, in verse 22 through 27, I picked out some verses there on the screen. Wives, said the Apostle, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the ecclesia, and he is the saviour of the body. So if Christ gave his life for the ecclesia, then what the Apostle is saying is then, that's the kind of relationship we should have between man and wife. In, in, in marriage that the husband should give his life if you like in service to the wife and likewise the wife to the husband therefore just as he continues as the ecclesia is subject to Christ so let the wives to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the ecclesia and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word so what the apostle is saying is, is that just as we saw in the garden, the man and woman to be together, of one purpose, of one mind as it were, intimately linked together, and that was going to be the relationship between God and his son and the Lord Jesus Christ. God's called out a people, the ecclesia, to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head. And in this case, would symbolize, the man would symbolize Christ, and the woman, or the rest of the ecclesia, would symbolize the woman. So. We can see why God's done what he's done in the Garden of Eden there. But that's not just what women should do. What about men? And this is the important point when, when people say, well, the Bible is sexist, it's all about the man. It's not all about the man, is it? Because the Apostle Paul goes on, so husbands are to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. We're all selfish, aren't we, by nature? But the apostle saying is, think about somebody other than yourself, in this case, the wife. For no one ever hid his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherishes it just as the Lord does for the ecclesia. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And we heard that, didn't we, back in, in Genesis chapter 2. Flesh and bones. That's the kind of relationship that the believers have with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery or a great secret other translations have, which I think is a bit better. This is a great secret, but I speak concerning Christ and the Ecclesia. The man and the woman were to be comparable to each other, have an intimate relationship together in a bond of unity. And that was the model for the Ecclesia. That the believers and the Lord Jesus Christ should be as one, each serving each other, but each understanding the role that they've got to pay. So then he says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now there's nothing particularly sexist in that. Now you might not agree with the order of things, but it's a Bible talk tonight, and we're just trying to put across what, what the Bible is, is teaching. Because there's a greater picture than that. We started with Genesis, but when we look at Revelation, we get these words. The Apostle John saw a vision. And what did he see? He said, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife, and the Lamb being an epithet of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the whole purpose of God was between one man and one woman, that the whole book of the Bible leads us to the end when the whole earth should be filled with men and women that want to give, to give glory to God and it's seen as a marriage, a great marriage in the kingdom age and so we see that, that verse there verse 10 and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God and in that one little cameo we see there that the kingdom of God it's a heavenly kingdom, but it's upon the earth. And the marriage that we're talking about, as we saw in Genesis, is between, as it were, a man and a woman. The woman being all the believers of all the ages, coming together to be as one. And that's quite a long preamble to our talk this evening. But I think it's, it's, it, we need to understand what God's purpose is. And that will help us to understand when we look at various scriptures, we look at the context, we see God's doing why he's doing certain things. And we can understand when we come to the New Testament, and the teaching of Christ and the Apostles, why the teaching the way that they are. And we see the ultimate goal is that all the earth should be filled with God's glory. But what about women in the uh, ministry of Jesus? Did he totally exclude them? Was it just the 12 apostles that he chose? Well, I just want to bring up a few, a few scriptures just to, just to illustrate that actually that wasn't the case. And if you've never read the Bible in the full before, you'll see, perhaps surprised, how much women actually featured in the purpose of God and particularly in the ministry of Jesus. Luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3 give us a really good indication of what it was like to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just read together these verses. And it came to pass afterward that he went through every city, this is Jesus, and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him, the twelve apostles and the royal male weren't there. But Luke's make it important to understand he said it wasn't just the men and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities Mary called Magdalene out of whom went seven devils she'd been healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ she was there and Joanna the uh, steward I beg your pardon and Susanna and many others which ministered unto him of their substance these women chose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ not just with their with their minds as well but also with their substance so Jesus wasn't sexist at all. He included men and women in there. Now it takes all sorts, doesn't it? Jesus would have everybody come to him. But it's got to be on, on God's terms, hasn't it? And that's, and that's what, we, what we've seen earlier. And we'll, we'll bring up a few more passages. But what about this? Luke 23, verse 28. When Jesus was arrested, before he should be crucified, all the men, the disciples, ran away and fled and left him alone. But the women remained constant, even when the brethren fled. It's important to note that, isn't it? And at the cross, there was only one man left there, the Apostle John. But the women were there, at the foot of the cross, right there. They had an empathy with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus was crucified, he was put in a, in a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had prepared the body... But the women wanted to come later on and make a full preparation. I don't think there was enough time 
for, for uh, Joseph and Nicodemus to prepare a full burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the women had seen that and had noted that. Now we're going to come back and we say there in Mark 16 verse 1 that Mary Magdalene and the Mary mother of James and Salome, they brought sweet spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Such was the effect on them by the Lord Jesus Christ that they felt compelled to do something. Even though he was dead, they hadn't yet understood the scriptures that Christ would become alive. But nonetheless, that was the feeling that they had for him. And when the Lord was risen, who did he appear to first? It wasn't a man. No, it was to Mary Magdalene. And Jesus con conversed with her at that time. There's another interesting account. The woman at the well, you may remember the story very well. But I just want to pick up on one interesting observation here. This was the observation of the disciples when they come to Jesus and they saw him conversing with the woman at the well. And the verse there, John 4 verse 27 reads this. And at this point, his disciples came and they saw him, as we say, conversing one to another. And he says, and they marveled, marveled that he talked with the woman. Now, culturally, it wasn't acceptable that a man should be conversing with a woman in public. But Jesus Christ wasn't sexist, was he? He would preach the gospel to everybody, and particularly to this woman. She had an interest. Jesus understood that, and he taught her the scriptures. It's interesting that the apostles, none of them said to the woman, what are you doing here? Who do you seek? And they all said to Jesus, why are you talking with her? Because they had to learn the lesson as well. But whether you're a man or a woman, if you come to Jesus to understand the scriptures, then there is a reward for you. Whatever your circumstance. And finally, we think of Mary and Martha. Now, they hosted the Lord Jesus Christ the last six days of his life in Bethany. And each day Jesus would go from Jerusalem back to Bethany. It was like a haven for him um, in the, the uh, tumultuous times in which he lived in that last week. Now, they weren't just there to, to lodge in his house and to give him food, although he did that. They actually conversed with Jesus, and Jesus taught the pair of them. First Mary, but afterwards, I'm sure, Martha would come. And so we read here that, Now it happened as they went that he entered into a certain village, which was Bethany, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into his ho her house. And Jesus obviously went in. He had no qualms about doing that. And she had a sister also called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And that's all that God requires, isn't it? Jesus requires to sit at his feet and listen to his word and do as best we can to follow what he wants us to do. Now I mentioned the Apostle Paul. He was given the task to spread the gospel message to out throughout the Gentiles. And all I want to do on this screen here is just to put up a few verses here from the final chapter of Romans 16, the letter that he wrote. And the Apostle Paul is at pains to, to pick out certain women, certain sisters, in these chapters and you can read them for yourself on the screen there and the list goes on in this chapter so the apostle paul even when he was writing as we go through that list of who he's saluting at various points women feature quite heavily throughout that list so christianity sort of wasn't sexist from that point of view everybody was included and we see here here's a woman a businesswoman of no mean stature Maybe she, she was attracted to the preaching of the Apostle Paul. But clearly the Apostle was of such a disposition that she could feel she could go up to him and speak to him and converse with him. And the Apostle Paul stayed at her, her house for, for quite a while. And she tended to things which Paul spoke. So I think we, we can see from that that actually Christianity wasn't sexist, and that neither was the Apostle Paul who brought the Christian message to, to, the, uh, to the Gentile nations. But... What about women priests? This is where it's often the Bible is obviously often seen as being sexist. Why can't we have women priests? Why can't women preach from the pulpits in the churches? We see the uh, 25 years of women in the Church of England is celebrated, but we don't think that's scriptural. It might be, it might be popular amongst the churches. Some churches, I must add, not all of them. But the teaching in the scripture is quite clear. The Apostle Paul, who we said, was not sexist. He said, let the women keep silence in your churches or ecclesias. 
Now, why was that? Well, we deliberately started in Genesis. And we talked about the creation of man and woman. And they were put in the garden. And they had a simple test, which was to educate them in the, in the thinking of, of, of God. They were challenged by certain things. One particularly, they could eat of all the trees in the Garden of Eden, except one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so we read in Timothy that, as Genesis said, that Adam was first formed and then Eve. So what's this got to do with women speaking in, in, the, in the ecclesia or the churches? Well, the point was that Eve disobeyed the command of God and ate of the fruit. There was a serpent there in the garden and she listened. Rather than listening to, to Adam, her husband, and listening to the words of God, she listened to the serpent that was in the garden and was deceived. The serpent said, you shall not surely die. And she perhaps thought about that and thought about it and thought, well, actually, perhaps the serpent was right. Perhaps we're not going to die. And, it, and they didn't die immediately. The sentence was going to be a longer, a longer term. But nevertheless, the woman, she was deceived and it said there, in the transgression. And when God Christ what was going on, he said, well, the serpent may guard me and I did eat. She didn't listen to the words of God or her husband. She listened to her own thoughts, if you like. And this is what the record says, that when the woman Eve saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. So whose fault was it? Well, when God made an inquiry of, of Adam and Eve, this is what he said to, to Eve. She was accountable for her own sin. She didn't do what God wanted. And he said unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we can see, can't we, from Genesis here, what was going wrong from the start, and the sentence that God was going to put upon the man and the woman for their sins. And so Eve, right from the start, was to be under her husband's rule. But we've already seen it in Ephesians. That doesn't mean to dominate or to bully. It just means that there's a role to play there. Husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your own husbands. And this, is, this is the reason why sisters can't speak in the meeting. But Adam didn't get off scot-free because he was responsible. Eve was to be his companion, but Adam was responsible. And so we could read in um, Romans 5, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. But it was actually through Eve, really, wasn't it, originally? But the man was accountable for his companion. He should have known better. And so the great responsibility stems with Adam. And that's why the scripture says that by one man sin entered into the world. And part of the gospel message is, well, we all die. How are we going to get out of this mess? Well, as in Adam, all die. But even so, in Christ, shall all be made of the life. And that's the point of the whole ecclesia. Get baptised into the ecclesia. You come out of the, the fallen family of Adam and you come into the family of God. It's part of a marriage between the believers and the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul continues in Timothy, quoting again from, from the words of Genesis. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. I've highlighted the word there, they. Interesting, isn't it? Because it's not the woman by herself, it's the man and the woman continuing together then they'll be saved now the Apostle Paul summarised all these things very well for us in, when he's writing to the Corinthians he's made it clear but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God even Christ himself is subject to, to God there was an order of things that God set in place this has got nothing to do with intellectual capacity there are many clever women that are more clever than men and there are many clever men that are more clever than women that's the universal truth isn't it but that's not the point it's not intellectual capacity it's what went on in the garden and the precedent that was set it's about obedience to God's word a clear order isn't it of what God wants so can can Women not speak about the scriptures. Can that, they not, cannot teach. Well, the advice from the Apostle Paul is that yes, together, but always under the authority of the man. 
And so we read one particular woman, Aquila and Priscilla, in Acts chapter 18. We find that they were going to speak to a chap called Apollos, and his understanding of scriptures wasn't quite right. So it was Aquila, we notice the scriptures there, and Priscilla together, took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. So the Bible is not against women speaking, but not when they come together as an ecclesia. In fact, if the woman manage to be so close, then it's encouraged, isn't it, that together go forth to spread God's word with a unity of purpose. Galatians chapter 3 really crystallizes all these things for us. It says not intellectual capacity, but it's the purpose of God. So the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 3 verse 22, he says, But the scripture hath concluded, all are under sin, male and female, but that the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That's a criteria, those that believe. Where he says, we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying is salvation is available to all by faith in Christ Jesus. There is no discrimination at all by faith. And he goes on, doesn't he? Now, we'll put here the Rotherham's translation. It's the emphasised Bible, so it reads a little bit differently, but it, as, as the title suggests there, the Bible, it emphasises the, sort of the, the real points of the scripture. I just want us to, to think about these words as they come on the screen. For ye, he says, as many as into Christ have been immersed, have been baptised. They've put on Christ. So he says, there cannot be Jew or Greek. There cannot be bond or free. There cannot be male and female. For all ye are one in Christ Jesus. So in the eyes of God, faith and obedience is what matters. We have different roles to play, but that's not the point here. God doesn't discriminate. But we notice there, it's not to talk about racism tonight, but he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Anybody in the world could come to an understanding of the scriptures of God and believe. No one is barred in that sense. Now the Apostle Paul gives some good advice which in today's climate, environment, people don't want to hear certain things, do they? They want to do what they want to do. And that's across the whole of the world, isn't it? In different walks of life. But this is the advice that the Scriptures give it, the, Paul, the Apostle Paul gives us. He says, For I say through the grace given to me from God, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And that's the key, isn't it? People might say, well, I want this job, or I want to do that, or I should be able to do this. But the Apostle Paul is saying, no, we've all got a role to play, and as we've seen earlier, all got a role to play, we've all got a different function. No one is really more important than anybody else, from the least to the greatest, to the male or the female, when it comes to being in Christ in the ecclesia. So he says, so we being many are one body in Christ. It's a unity, no discrimination. And individually, members of one another. As the man and the woman will submit to each other for the mutual benefit, so it is likewise in the ecclesia of God, submitting mutually together for the benefit of the whole. So that's my understanding of, of what the Bible teaches about sexism. I think you see that there are roles to play by the male and the female. But we've all got a part to play in God's kingdom and now in God's ecclesia. And that when we understand we've got different functions, then that perhaps helps us that we don't want what we see as the best job or the most important thing. Everybody's important, from the doorman letting you in, from the person speaking, from playing the piano, or whatever it is we do. We're all important. Many members, but we don't all have the same function. In Romans chapter 9, we have this, this picture that the Apostle Paul is, is speaking. And he's quoting from, from the Old Testament in Isaiah. And he says there, has the potter no right over the clay? And we get the picture there that a vessel is being made, an earthen vessel. And if you picture that, they, these hands making this vessel are actually the hands of God, who created man and woman in the beginning, from the earth Adam was created, wasn't it? And the Apostle Paul is saying, well, if God's created all these things, then who are we to say otherwise? 
And that's difficult for people in this day and age, isn't it? With human rights, and um, we've got rights, we should be able to do this, we should be able to do that. That is fine. But when we're talking about salvation and coming to God, then everybody needs to submit. If they want to be in the kingdom, God's given us free will. Nobody's forced to be in the kingdom of God. But if we want to be in the kingdom, then we need to understand what God wants and understand his purpose. And that we have no right to tell God what we should or shouldn't be done. And this, this is the quotation here, I've got it in the ESV. When he's speaking about Israel, God had created Israel, if you like, the, pot, the potter was God and the vessel was Israel. And God's saying to Israel through, the, through Isaiah, you turn things upside down. Shall a potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker? He didn't make me. Or the thing formed say of him? Who formed it? He's got no understanding. God, as we said, has got a purpose. We are his workmanship. God has created, as we saw in, in Genesis chapter 1. He will ultimately bring his purpose to a conclusion. And if we want to be in that kingdom, then we need to submit to his will. But the benefits of the kingdom are wonderful. A time of peace, a time of righteousness, a time of judgment, a government that doesn't know what it's doing, that's uh, it's led by God and not by man. So I'll leave you with that thought. Has the potter no right over the clay? Thank you.